Man, I'm all fired up for this one today, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to throw it back to 1973. Welcome to the NBA draft. And with the 16th overall pick, the Milwaukee Bucks select Swin Nader, center out of UCLA. <laughs> And you ready? I am. All right. Tyler, are you ready? Oh, let's party. <laughs> timeout. Tyler, who are we taking a timeout with today? Well, Kevin, thank you, man. I'm all fired up for this one today, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to throw it back to 1973. Welcome to the NBA draft. And with the 16th overall pick, the Milwaukee Bucks select Swin Nader, center out of UCLA. So, Swin, thanks Woo! for being on the show. And our first question is, what are you going to bring to the Bucks besides your prolific rebounding? What am I going to bring to the Bucks? Yes, besides your prolific rebounding. What else does Swin Nader have besides his rebounding that he's going to make the Bucks better? Scoring. I mean, if, if you know, I saw I, a couple I, I baby books. Hey, I joined the 30 30 club when I was there and 30 <laughs> uh, points, 33 rebounds. So, you know, now I do have to say that. Um, some of those, uh, uh, quite a few of those uh, points were a result of a missed shot. And uh, uh, quite a few of those missed shots were my own. <laughs> <laughs> is that how you got the NBA uh, rebound record? Is that, yeah, first thing, is you, that know, Moses, you know, Moses was good at that. So uh, just tip, 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 you know, he, he had a great shooting, uh, he had a great rebound average, but a horrible uh, shooting average because he kept missing all the shots just get the rebound. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that was one of the games when everything went my way. So yeah, I brought uh, scoring and rebounding, uh, not too many assists. I was pretty much uh, felt that I had a better shot than everybody else. <laughs> I uh, think so. I think so. Yeah. I got to ask, how much maintenance was that mustache back then? Was that a lot of work to maintain? No, I didn't groom hard at all. Hardly got a haircut. Uh, I didn't even need to shave back then. I was a <laughs> groomer. I had a couple of hairs in my chinny chin chin. That's about it. Um, but yeah, the mustache, you know, when I started, you know, when it started hitting the, the hamburger on the way in, then I, I knew it was time. <laughs> and that was a new castle, you know, not, that was a white castle. That was a small one. So, so yeah, I knew it was time. And when I found, you know, a couple of uh, grains of rice in there one time, I thought maybe I should shave it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you talked about those White Castle burgers, and uh, Tyler announced that you played uh, at UCLA. Um, for the audience that may or may not know, um, at that time you had, were playing under uh, Wooden, and you won two national championships. And Coach Jim Johnson told us that you were probably the second best center in the country playing behind the Bill Walton. What was that experience like uh, just working with such a, a prolific leader that now so many people write about um, in Wooden? It wouldn't. Well, you know, I, I did sit the bench. I only played a couple minutes a game. Now, the problem was the center runs straight up and down the floor, right? He doesn't get to the sideline. I was hoping Bill would get close to me so I can stick my foot out, <laughs> maybe cause an injury, you know, <laughs> accidentally. And then at the end of the game, but, you know, he just kept going straight and up and down the floor. Uh, to play for John Wooden was an experience that you don't realize how incredible that was and how unique that was and how high level that was until after you graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you get to know him a little bit, you know, I had the opportunity to write a couple of books with John Wooden, one about his teaching uh, entitled You Haven't Taught Until They've Learned, which is really a great book. Especially now, I think, you know, if parents are still teaching their kids at home, uh, this is the book to get to uh, find out John Wood's teaching methods. Hmm. And uh, and then one on the offense, on the UCLA offense. But, uh, what you know, it'd take another hour to tell you everything that happened in practice. Um, a lot of people have the uh, uh, vision John Wooden as a real nice guy. <laughs> you know, like, like, why don't you guys run the offense? Would you, you know, would you, would you mind? Um, uh, nothing is farther from the truth <laughs> uh, further from the truth it's um he was a uh how, how would you say it he, he was an animal in practice he was impatient he was not out of control never out of control but don't make the same mistake twice 
or he's all over you, right? I told yeah. you that, you know, it happened to me once and he had Coach Cunningham take me to another basket and learned it until I got it right because he didn't have the time for it, right? Everything was about time. Everything was about getting the maximum amount of production, game-like production in a practice possible in a two and a half hour practice, which never started late and which never ended late. It was a 2.29 to 4.59 was practice. And we may have stopped a couple of minutes early, but never over. Everything was planned yeah. to the minute. We ran and sprinted from drill to drill. Everything was ready at the next station for the next drill. And we went right to it. We had a six sips of water uh, throughout practice, which is all you really need. And, and uh, you know, the, the efficiency of the way he taught, um, he said, you know, his philosophy was learn by doing. Show him how to do it, demonstrate it, show it, explain it, have him try it, have him try it, correct, have him try it, correct, have him try it, correct, and keep having us play ball until we found something, until we got it right, until it clicked. Uh, not necessarily what he wanted us to do, but he wanted us to play a lot of basketball, two on two, three on three, four on four, all within the framework of what we're doing so that we could discover not only the uh, how new ways to make it work based on what we were capable of doing, you know, like last year's team may not uh, have been able to, a player on last year's team that wasn't on this year's team may not have been able to do what this year's player uh, can do, like Larry Hollifield could do so much. Uh, Sydney Wicks could do so much more than Shackelford. So uh, we discovered uh, within the, the playing with each other all the time, uh, not only new things, we invented things. Coach wanted us to invent things. Practice was a laboratory for inventing ways to do things. And we learned how to play, but also it was to learn each other. Our idiosyncrasies, the timing of everything. The timing is so much a part of it. And so when Walton gets the ball at the high post and Jamal cuts back door, you know, it's, he has to be gone. You know, he has to be gone and Walton knows when he's going to go because Jamal goes a little early or somebody else might go a little later or whatever, but he, we know each other. And we, we know that uh, we, we, we give each other, um, we know where we're going to uh, throw the ball. We know we want uh, such and such a score, but yet all the other players are ready to score. And we gloried and somebody that was not a high scorer getting points mm -hmm. because that means we got more pistons firing, right? And when you get to the championship games during the playoffs, the, the team with the most pistons firing is going to win that game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot that happened in practice. Uh, his correcting methods, his uh, impatience, uh, the drills. We, we had very few drills. We played a lot of basketball. Uh, we, we did the whole part method. Uh, you know, you show the hole, work on the parts, put the hole back together again, and you know everything was game like. But it was uh, it was tough. It was uh, the practices were way tougher than games. Wow. But we were we were taught to make decisions on our own. So in the three years that I was there, because <clears throat> I did redshirt one year, coach never called one timeout. <laughs> oh my gosh! All year. Three years. Holy <laughs> oh <my> cow. <laughs> oh, my. Hope the ball God. goes out of bounds a few times to catch some breathers, I guess. <laughs> Woo. Hey, when a teacher, uh, no, when a professor teaches, um, you know, somebody goes to law school or something, and you got these law professors, they want to teach them so that they can practice on their own without having to come back and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Right. So you put them through the fire and you make them make decisions on their own. I mean, look at Legally Blonde. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> on how not to do it. No, it was I mean, you know, it was that kind of thing where where you you you're forced to learn on your own. It's a yeah. Japanese way that they teach in their schools. They make kids struggle when they teach math. They don't they say you can do this. Figure it out. Figure it out. They make them sweat. They make them cry. Yeah. yeah. And then they, they figure it out, right? With a little bit of help maybe here and there. But that's the way it was so that when we got in the game, uh, which was different than, it's different playing, our first team playing against the second team, which I was on, uh, because you're playing against an opponent you've never played against before. Mm -hmm. You have a different center, you have a different system. 
And we just kind of figured it out really quickly. But another thing that helped is we ran the heck out of the basketball. You know, mm -hmm. we were the Loyola Marymount of the day, yeah. uh, starting from 1948 on. We we put pressure on the other team and we ran we ran the death to where eventually they caved and they couldn't keep up with the speed. And they weren't used to passing, dribbling, and uh, and everything at a high speed like that. And mistakes started happening and. Next thing you know, we're... And then you uh, won two national championships. Yeah. <laughs> That's been a little bit about the 40 minutes of hell down in my hog country. But you know, we were looking, uh, <laughs> swaying that... Um, he, John, uh, Coach Wooden said that he learned how to coach basketball by teaching high school English. Can you elaborate a little bit about that for us? Yep. It's the teaching methods, right? He developed his period of success uh, and his definition first for success when teaching high school English because his student, the parents of his students all expected their children to get A's. But he knew that God in his infinite wisdom didn't make us all the same. Some of us, I have two grandsons. One is an incredible writer. He can write. The other one struggles in writing, but the other one was top in the math, top math in uh, fifth grade in the whole class and, um, and reading, but he just didn't have the talent for writing, right? That, that Aiden does. So, you know, you've got a, uh, he had to devise a method to where everyone could feel successful because they tried their hardest. So the definition is success is the peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you are capable, right? So, and then the 15 blocks in the pyramid, industriousness, enthusiasm, loyalty, cooperation, friendship, uh, you know, uh, self-control, uh, initiative, intentness, alertness, and uh, skill, uh, condition, and team spirit, and then poison and confidence, and finally competitive greatness were, um, were made so that you could have a way to get there and feel successful. So, you know, that was, uh, that was everything for coach and, uh, your question, I want to get back to the question was, um, um, yeah, I just asked you if you could kind of elaborate on when the coach said, uh, that he learned how to, how to coach basketball by teaching yeah. high school English. Yeah. So he, he, uh, that was his definition and he used that with us and then <clears throat> he, um, he, in order to be a really good high school teacher or any teacher, you have to be very organized. You have to plan everything to the minute. You can't wing it and say one day, I think as we'll learn this for as far as we can go, right? You have to say, okay, this is requires 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Then we have recess, right? And then we got this and this. And so you have to, because you have state standards that you have to get the kids to. And so you have to plan all of your lessons, lesson planning, so that uh, by the end of the year, they reach uh, those standards, they, they accomplish those standards. And so this happens in English class and he took the same organizational skills, practice planning uh, uh, and, and adopted them to basketball. And that's how he was able to get so much out of a practice. And he continued to get more and more out of practice every single year that he coached for uh, 20, what, five years, I think. That's him. So you, you hear about all these stories uh, because you were playing in the time of the country was kind of going through its same evolution, right? It was, uh, it was totally different, um, all about peace, all about community. We just went through a, a grand pandemic and um, a lot of it, I think, is we're wanting to get back to that sense of community. And I know Wooden was um, somewhat adverse to, I don't know what, uh, what you got involved with, but I know Bill Walton was doing some other things that he's very out in the open about. Um, what was it like playing in, in a time during college where it was like so open and free about peace and, 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 and harmony um, and then having a coach and, and kind of entering the locker room with a coach with that type of mentality? Yeah, there was no harmony and peace uh, inside the college pavilion Yeah, during practice. It was war. <laughs> it was war. It was all about hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. In fact, Ron Gallimore, who wrote 
who co-wrote uh, You Haven't Taught Until They've Learned with me. He's a professor at UCLA at the time, and he was running a study on uh, John Wooden's teaching methods, uh, you know, with uh, keeping him uh, or with the, the premise that uh, you have to be nice to get stuff out of the kids, right? Because that was the thing with teaching, that all that love and peace mm -hmm. and, you know, San Francisco stuff got, um, <laughs> I know, uh, it always comes out of there. So, and still coming out of there. Uh, <laughs> just ask Nancy. So anyway, um, you know, all, all of that, he thought that he was going to get that from watching, uh, observing practices and recording what Coach said, but instead he got the opposite. <laughs> I received a compliment three years, three times. Wow. From Coach Wooden. Wow. And I was a reserve, and he complimented the reserves more than the starters. <laughs> Bill hardly ever got a compliment, you know? In fact, Kareem, right? Kareem was a really good student, and Bill was too, both straight A's. So I guess there were, uh, Kareem was taking a class in something uh, that was very difficult, and he told Coach about it, and Coach said, well, just do the best you can. So you know, at the end of the, the quarter, K Kareem went uh, and had this piece of paper in his hand, went up to Coach, he says, Coach, I got an A in this class. <laughs> oh, my I got God. an A in it. Coach said, you're supposed to, right? Aren't you supposed to? <laughs> so tough love it was tough love it was the adverse oh he was so good at this he was so good at this so um yeah he he knew the balance uh between compliments and uh and and, and uh, exhortation mm -hmm. and for each one of us it was different mm -hmm. he studied people and he knew how to get the most out of each one of us and that's a gift. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, but it is. also is a determination to do it because when you do, it's an edge you have in that final game of the final four. Mm -hmm. Everything is a little at that point is a little thing. Mm -hmm. The talent's going to be about the same. It's the fundamentals. Are you going to throw the ball away needlessly under pressure? Mm -hmm. It's teamwork, right? It's conditioning. It's not just physical conditioning, it's mental conditioning. And we were put through mental conditioning for two and a half hours every day. So all these little, these things that I'm mentioning are little things and little things, a whole bunch of little things end up being a big thing and could make a difference. So he was always studying people and doing all the little thing, you know, get an extra minute, get an extra rep out of this, uh, you know, out, out of this uh, drill. We never, this is going to surprise you that, you know, you know what scrimmage is, of course, you know, when you scrimmage in basketball, mm -hmm. we never once scrimmaged from one end to the other and all the way back. Wow. The first team was running an offensive play, let's say, and we, the second team, were defending them. And they were trying, this is part of that repetition I'm telling you about, where they're trying to work together to see what they can get. And so they did it. And then we would, either, we would get the ball either after they scored, which happened a lot, <laughs> or we got a turn, rebound, or we got a turnover, right? And we would transition to the other end and shoot whatever way. We better hurry up because coach is going to blow the whistle. <laughs> Coach blew the whistle, and then we turned it around, and the first team went on offense again on the other end. Oh. And they did the same thing going this way, and they turned around, and for 15 minutes, they did the same thing. <laughs> now, two things. One, can you imagine that what that repetition does for your, you know, when you only have seven guys on the starting team that, that play, the rest of us never hardly play. Mm -hmm. So they knew each other very well, and they were just getting to know each other. And how this worked. And we were trying to throw different stuff at them, you know, monkey wrenches to try to screw things up. And they liked it because they, they reacted to it, right? Yeah. And then, uh, then the other thing is, how could we be in such great condition when we never went back and forth like that? It's because we ran really fast <laughs> like this, right? 
And also we had other drills that were full court, but uh, yeah, that's a, nobody does that. No. Dang. So that was pretty much 15 minutes of all offense for your starters. Yeah. Or they were working on a defense or a full court press. It was, you know, whatever it was, it was down and that's it. Never down and back. Wow. So when, well, I just wanted to ask you, dude, thank you so much for this and everything you're telling us here. This is a gift from a godsend uh, for Kevin and I. It really is. Um, I heard you talking about ego um, through Coach Don Johnson. I want to pivot over to Coach Johnson real quick. Um, and Kevin and I interview a lot of leaders in the Rochester area and in the South and whatnot. You're the first uh, West Coaster you got on this show. And you mentioned uh, how Coach Don Johnson had no ego. What do you think a right fit ego is, and how do you, how do you get rid of ego in your experience? Well, everybody has an ego, right? But and most people let it get in the way, right? And it's tough, right? It's it's a it's a tough thing. You have to ask yourself the question: Why am I doing this? You know, is is this all for me? Is this all for somebody else, or what? Um, you know, in, in anything, you know, whether you're doing something for somebody, um, you know, helping somebody with their groceries or, or doing something, are you doing it for yourself? And you ask yourself, you know, am I doing it? Yeah, it makes me feel good. You know, coach said it's impossible to do something for somebody else without getting something in return, right? You always get something in return, but is that why you're doing it? Um, it doesn't really matter that much um, because feeling good about that is natural. It's God given, right? That you feel good about helping somebody. Uh, Walton feels good about only scoring 15 points, <laughs> but Hollyfield got 25 because they were double teaming him and Hollyfield was hitting that jumper from the left side. <coughs> Overjoyed <laughs> in the locker room. We don't talk about somebody scoring. We talk about that play that we made together that was just totally threw him off, off guard, you know, after a timeout, <clears throat> we knew they were going to go zone to try to screw us up and we were ready. Mm -hmm. Even coach didn't even need to say it. We said, you know, I bet they're going to go zone after this because they play zone. Check it out. Okay. Watch it. If, if that happens, both of you guys come up high. <laughs> right? So both of you guys come up. Can you imagine two players coming up high, high post, both elbows, and then you got cutters. No. Who, go, who goes with those guys? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> two guys from the inside? And then they have back doors, right? So we were always inventing Get stuff. Get this like coach that. a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was just, uh, it was a great time. That's, and, and, and Tyler brought up a good point. It's checking your ego. And you had to check your ego, too. I mean, uh, Coach uh, Jim Johnson was sharing that you were probably the second best center in the country playing behind the best center in the country. I mean, that had to be kind of checking your ego at the same time and making sure that you're challenging them in every practice, but also celebrating the wins together. How did you, I mean, at, at that age, I mean, I can only go back to my hot-headedness back in college. How did you deal with that? I didn't know I was the second best center in the country because I never, never played against all of the centers. Mm -hmm. We only play against a fraction of them. And there wasn't that much on TV that in those days, right? And you can't really tell from TV. I did find out after I graduated, <clears throat> when I played in uh, an all-star game with the best players in the country, I, Coach Wooden got me on the, on the West squad. He talked to people in the, you know, he, he's a backup center, but he's pretty good. Can you get him? <laughs> uh, and I was MVP. <clears throat> so I did find out there uh, and I knew kind of, you know, that I was good. And I, I thought about leaving a couple of times, but you know, the grass is not necessarily greener. Plus, Hey, I had a really good chance of going pro being on that team. We were on TV all the time more than any other team. Right. So I was known. So, yeah, but when you're playing for John Wooden, because he's, he's without ego, uh, he never took credit for wins. He took credit for, for, you know, bad games or whatever. We, we, I didn't lose a game when I was there, but so I never experienced him. Well, actually, I was, I was uh, that sounds funny, right? Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> um, when I was, uh, when I was redshirting, uh, we lost to Notre Dame. And so they came back from, uh, 
from Indiana in the next practice, the next day, the next Monday, you would not, you would, you couldn't tell. We had lost or won that last game. Couldn't wow. tell. He told me he just dropped it like it never happened. Dropped it. We just, we needed it. Wow. We needed, we needed to, uh, to get a wake up call. But then, you know, we got homework, but that's not beside the point. So he didn't have an ego. When, uh, after the games, the TV host always had an interview with coach about the game and he always invited a player and coach would never invite the leading scorer. He would invite somebody who was an assist leader. Wow. One time he invited me because I made Walton better in practice. <laughs> oh so, my gosh. See, he sent the message that nobody is that important. Wow. Nobody is the reason why we win. Wow. It's us. It's us why we win. And he demonstrated it through, um, I mean, he taught through uh, example. And after a while, you kind of get the message and you kind of get into the joy of that, right? Mm -hmm. And it's lasted the rest of my life. Uh, you know, I work for Costco. I've been working for Costco for 25 years. <clears throat> and I do, I know this, the same thing. You, you do what you can, you help others, but you never take credit for anything going right because it takes a whole bunch of people to do it, right? Wow. Yeah. It does take a village, yeah. yeah. And Coach was giving credit to the to the custodians for sweeping the floor for somebody cleaned the backboards one time in the gym. He <laughs> brought him in front of the team. And we all gave him a hand. So what, what he did. So he really humbled you guys. I mean, and didn't allow for 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 anybody to really get that. Oh, I mean, Bill Walton and, and obviously Kareem and, and some of the other people that you had mentioned. I mean, that's 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 a lot of everybody would think that there's a lot of big heads or egos in the room at one time. What's um? So so I know. Let me just add this: we had egos. We never stopped having egos, mm -hmm. but the ego was that I'm a really good team player. Mm -hmm. That was my ego. Mm -hmm. Mm. I, I, I was proud of that, right? And still am mm -hmm. that I was part of that, that situation. Mm -hmm. And then as, as a key man, I mean, I played two minutes a game and I'm getting, and you guys want me on. Of course, yeah. I, had a pro career. I had a pro career too, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're two nobodies from Rochester, and here we are talking to one of the one of the all time leading rebounders in the NBA. Got nope. the coach, or got John Wooden as a coach. That's unbelievable. Now I can't do it, can't do it without you guys. You can't do it without me. And exactly. uh, yeah, we're all part of this, and the message goes out, and it makes a difference in somebody that's hearing this. That's <clears throat> maybe a coach, maybe a parent, right? And we both did it. Yeah. Right. I okay. love that. One of the things I wanted to ask, because um, obviously you have also, um, not if your two national championships were not enough, um, we went back in your history and you're talking about kind of your, your beginnings um, and how you came over to this country and you were on a show, a show I had never heard of before. Um, and you shared a little bit about that on your website when we were watching that um, series of you, of you speaking in, in Canada. How did that have, did that have an impact? I, I, I hate to say it didn't, but how did that impact the rest of your life and also your view on, on relationships? So briefly, <coughs> you're talking about when I came to America. Mm -hmm. I was born in Holland. My mom and dad divorced at three when I was three. Wow. And uh, my mom had, had custody of three kids that were five, three, and just born. Wow. She took the just born and the two of us were farmed to a friend of hers. Then she met my stepfather and they went to America and left my sister and I at that place. And then we went to three foster homes and ended up in an orphanage before a television program here in, in the United States, Hollywood, NBC, <coughs> called It Could Be You. Mm -hmm. uh, many remember This Is Your Life. <clears throat> um, it's the forerunner of that. And it was a live Saturday evening show. Oh my God. They got a hold of it through some people that knew my mom and dad, my stepdad. And so they flew us over uh, from the orphanage to the Beverly Hills Hotel, right? Uh, yeah, I was pretty cool. It was pretty cool for me because 
I knew about Roy Rogers and I was looking for him. <laughs> I didn't see any, I didn't see any cow fields, horses, but I smelled, you know, but it was, uh, but he was actually pretty, probably really close to where I was. But anyway, I was into Roy Rogers. And I thought everybody here was cowboy. So that was my dream and I was stoked. And, um, and then, uh, you know, we got on the show. My mom and dad were brought by our friends, their friends to the show, thinking that they were just gonna watch the show. And all of a sudden the curtains opens, there's a little windmill, because we're from Holland, windmill. And the host got him upstage and opened the windmill and out we came. And, uh, and that's how I got here. But my stepdad was really, really mad uh, that this happened because he never wanted us to come over at all. Oh, wow. He told my mom, you know, that he wanted it, but he didn't really want it. He, already, he had two cars already and he, you know, they had a little house, but it was, uh, you know, he could have uh, easily paid for us to come over. But now he, there we were. So for the next uh, 10 years from age nine to 19, it was, um, I was living in hell at home. Yeah. It was, uh, it was beatings, beatings, um, capital punishment, you know, lots. It was hitting yeah. in your mouth, breaking your teeth, uh, never sending you to a dentist. Uh, so I had lost three teeth, um, uh, taking the, 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 the lock off the bathroom door. So you could go in and check the water when you're taking a shower because you're supposed to take cold shower because oh, it, he yeah. wouldn't let you take warm shower. And if you found any warmth in the water, he just beat you right there in the shower. Wow. It was like that every single day until I finally left home, right? Uh, when I got to Cypress College and I, I couldn't play basketball in high school, obviously. So um, I, a coach at Cypress College, Tom Lubin, who was Don Johnson's assistant, got me on the floor uh, just to practice and show me a hook shot. And he talked my stepdad and let me on the team. And then, uh, so the first year I didn't hardly play at all, except the last couple of games I got in, did pretty good. Went to the ghettos. Uh, Tom took me to the, the inner city of the ghettos every Saturday to play. I was the only white guy in the gym. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, you know, I got, took my lumps. And, <laughs> uh, and eventually I was uh, one of the guys, you know, and they wanted me on their team because I would help them win, right? I got good. The next year, uh, first game, uh, um, I, I, I won the game with two free so I, was, I beat the, uh, starting uh, the best center in the in the state and then my stepdad told me to quit the team oh because of the newspaper an article article about me in the paper and so I left home Wow and I stayed with a, one of my play uh, teammates and I moved from house to house nobody could feed me could afford to feed me <laughs> um, and then I eventually went to uh, UCLA we talk about overcoming fear and it sounds like you've overcome a lot of fear in your life. How do you keep, I guess, putting, put, keep putting the foot in front of you. And, and, and now you, you cherish being a team player and you cherish these types of relationships. And I, I don't know if Wooden was a, a father figure esque to you during that time of your life as well. Um, while you were in college. No, he was nobody's friend. He went home <laughs> after practice. Walton tried to get close to him, but no, he couldn't really. Uh, he was, he believed in a separation, right? Mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he wasn't your friend. He was your coach. He was your teacher. And uh, once practice was over, he was gone. Wow. And then he saw you. Now, if you want to talk to him in his office, you can do that almost any time you want. But he used to be frank with you, you know, and it was never laughing together or, you know, buddy, buddy stuff or anything like that. <laughs> uh, it was strictly professional. And uh, that's the way it was. <laughs> but he was a he became a very good close friend of mine after I graduated. I've been all right now. I know me Kevin. too. <laughs> um, well, Swin, what what uh, I guess what one you kind of hit on this already, I think, but I'd want to ask it again. I guess what's what's one of the one lessons you learned from Coach Wooden that you use today? Oh, there's no question. Some call it a continuous improvement. Some call it seeing how good you can get. It's that that's what we did at UCLA. We didn't stop improving un, until the season was over. We were always learning. A lot of teams coast, you know, when the playoffs start, they do a little few drills here and there and, you know, do a little running and walk through some plays. We were still scrimmaging. We were still 
uh, three on three, two on two, working on fundamentals. You know, when you do a pivot, get down there. Don't raise up. When you pivot, reach out, turn your head first, you know, and, um, and I want change of pace and change of direction. When you change the direction, I want you to go faster, 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 and then slow down, just cut, cut, cut. All of that, he was on your case. Uh, yeah, he was on your case all the time uh, about things, the last practice before the final game. It was all about that. Wow. And uh, I have taken that uh, into everything that I do. Now, I'm, I'm a magician. You guys don't know that. I'm yes, we, yeah, I we saw do. that. I was going to ask a little question well, on that. I, I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I work till 6 on my magic for three hours every single day. Wow. And um, and I just, you know, I used to shoot 500 hook shots a day. I could tell that baby hook was, was <laughs> really nice in that video. And it wasn't until about 100 that you start feeling something that you're doing better. Maybe a little turn of the shoulders a little more. It's going in, it's going in better. Maybe an early release. You say, oh, shoot, if I release it early, not only uh, does my body momentum go into the ball, makes it easier to shoot, but also I get it off quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do a lot of repetition, uh, repetition, repetition, the same thing over and over again, like a golf swing, then it starts clicking, then the body starts learning, and, and it knows. It, it can figure out how to do things better. You just do do it a bunch of times and it'll figure out. And same thing with uh, with cards to say shufflings. You know, I'm not going to give away any secrets other than, you know, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> you, better you better start getting up at two. You need four hours. I figured that one out. <laughs> so, but, you know, when you do a certain uh, maneuver over and over again, you know, a certain a riffle shuffle or something, you know, a riffle shuffle. I've done thousands of them, but it's not enough. You just keep doing it, keep doing it. The joy of doing that, guys, the joy of, of working at it and practicing. And, and like Larry Bird said, when I was, uh, when I first started out, I could practice an hour and improve this much. Now I practice for three hours and I can only improve this much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he said, and a lot of guys stop here. Mm -hmm. But it's that work, 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 and all of a sudden you, you learn something. You, oh my God, mm -hmm. you know, with a certain trick, right? So, oh, what if I say, if I say that, now that they'll understand. You know, mm -hmm. that's it's cool. all the work, and you know that separates uh, those who become good from those who become great. I and that's what I learned from Coach Wooden. Keep working, keep working, keep working, keep working at it. Seeing how good you can get. I love that. Are you the sole reason that Costco's way more badass than Sam's Club and <laughs> No. He was the second. <laughs> it's a team effort. <laughs> Just a little uh, little nut on the wheel. <laughs> like, those competitors have no shot if you're going against Swin Nader. Yeah, Jeez. forget about all, it. <laughs> all, all of our executives and everybody, that's the way we operate. That's but we, we we keep improving. Yeah, you, you got to keep doing it, especially when you're uh, number one, right? And in, in that yeah. club business, you you better keep improving and seeing how good you can get because uh, you'll find yourself number two. Real quick with a big target on your back. Uh, la <laughs> last last target. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole different story. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to scare you with that one. I should be, yeah, I yeah, should yeah. watch my mouth. <laughs> I thought that. I got I got one one question that I, I want because uh, you have a lot you have so many accolades right you know, your your history of, of just your life and, and that uh, story that you shared at your, with your home life um, and look at you now you're an executive at Costco you're you're a magician um, on the side um, but you also uh, still carry I mean NBA All Stars uh, rebounding um, in the, in the history books what does Swen Nader want to be remembered for. Being a really good grandpa. Wow. And I work at that really hard. Wow. <clears throat> I have three grandkids and I'm constantly working. Right now I'm working with Chase on his writing, right? So I wrote, he loves Legos and he's really good. We gave him a Lego set the other day. He put it together that night. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he's like a, a Lego master. <laughs> so I wrote a story um, written by Chase why I love Legos so much. 
right? The first paragraph is how we started. You guys know about writing, how we started. And somebody gave him a Lego set, da, 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 da. And he said, and now I love it. And he said, here are three reasons why I love it. You know, number one is you could do one in one day. Right? <laughs> Two, once you do one, no one can ever take it away from you. You know, there were three reasons. And at the end, he does a little sell job. He tried to get, he said, you know, I love basketball. I love tennis. My brother and I play tennis all the time and we love it. And, but sometimes, you know, at night, you can't play tennis and all that. And during the winter, it rains. So he says, I do Legos and it's become something I truly love. And I encourage every one of you to love, to love it too and try it, right? So this is what I wrote. And now he's going to do the same story uh, in his own words. Mm -hmm. So this is demonstration, explanation, and then he does it and I correct him. He does, I correct him. Hmm. And then he's done some repetition and then he can maybe try a new one on his own. So he just keeps, so this, this is what I do with the grandkids. I teach them how to play tennis. We just put them in a tennis camp here for a week and they just loved it. They're asking for lessons now, hmm. right? And, um, and so we're going to be in a grandpa well, and a husband too, of course, you know, yeah. but um, let's talk about the, the kids. I want to be remembered as being a really good papa. That's awesome. <laughs> Tyler, what's your last question for the king here, Swin? Oh, my. I don't even know anymore, Kevin. Uh, well, Swin, I guess I reckon I'll ask you if uh... – I guess if someone dropped, I don't know, $50 trillion in your pocket tomorrow and you couldn't spend it on yourself, what would you spend it on? Buy a big ego. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been in a spaceship with Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Well, Sven, thank you so much for being a part of this program with us. Uh, incredible, incredible stories. Tyler and I are notorious for taking notes. And I think I got about seven pages this time from this <laughs> conversation because awesome. there's just so many bite-sized um, pieces about leadership. And, and I think some, some great lessons for, for leaders out there that might be lost right now um, during times of turmoil. And, and it's an a wonderful opportunity for a little self-reflection. Um, and, but uh, also understanding that uh, it's constant improvement. You're, ne you're never there. You're always evolving. You're always adapting and you're always growing. That's right. Never, I mean, just keep going for perfection. You'll never reach it. Yeah. But uh, the journey is the fun thing. It is. The practice, you know, the championship, once the championship was over and winning the championship at UCLA, <coughs> it was all right. But it was every day together. Yeah. Working with each other, kidding each other, right? Making plays together, traveling together. That's the fun part. So as you're getting better at something, the journey, do it with somebody else too and share. You know, I've got a mentor from Magic that I share with every single morning we talk and um, just enjoy enjoy getting better at something and, and try to see how good you can get. I think it's a lot of fun, but don't forget to be a good papa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, thank you again, Swan. Okay. I know I won't win any two national championships like you, but I definitely have some takeaways for today and, and, and really showing a self-reflection on my life and, and I appreciate it so much. So thanks for being a great guest on Time Out with Leaders. Thank you guys. Take care and keep doing what you're Take doing. Care. Appreciate right. it, Swan. Thanks so much. All right. See y'all.